How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Red Bearded Wine Snob. Happy Mother's Day. I have to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Mothers, mother figures, grandmothers, stepmothers, mother-in-laws, any any other mothers you can think of, great-grandmothers, um, mothers-to-be. Yeah, I think, I think I got them all. Hope all the mothers of the world have an excellent day today. Have some wine. You deserve it. Cheers. Mm. Today, I've got some Cab Franc from Debonet Vineyards. And it's a 2020, 13% alcohol. Grown from the Grand River Valley, right from Debonet's own property. This stuff is good. I like to get this one. I just had some spaghetti. So actually, it was chicken parmesan. So a nice cab franc goes excellent with chicken parmesan. Good stuff. And cab franc. I had to get some cab franc because... We're doing the uh, Wines of the World episodes. This is my last Wines of the World episode. This is part four. So, hmm. there we go. So, for part four, I'm going to be going over the USA, us. Part one, I went over Europe. Part two was uh, Africa and Australia and some of them other places. Part three was South America and Canada and Mexico. And now I, I decided to finish up with us, the USA. And we've got quite a few wine growing regions within the USA. So definitely gives me plenty to talk about. And again, this being a live episode, I think this is going to be the last, the last live episode that I do for a little while. So if you've got any comments, I've got it up here. Go ahead and ask me a question, and I'll try to answer it the best I can. So, let's get this screen sharing thing going. Aha! There we go. Wait. Okay, let me try this again. It started and then it stopped. Share the screen. Share. <laughs> okay. Looks like we're good. All right. So, first wine growing region I'm going to talk about is California. Make that a little bigger here. So, these are the wine growing regions of California. Hopefully you're looking at the map and not my face. So we've got far north California, north California, the Sierra foothills, the inland valleys, the central coast, and then southern California. So California is one of the largest wine producing regions in the USA with more than 1,200 wineries and 107 different American viticultural areas. North Coast region includes the Napa Valley and Sonoma Valleys. So that's over here in this little yellow pocket right here. That's the North Coast. That's where you find Napa and Sonoma. Napa is one of the most famous wine producing regions in the world. Cabernet Sauvignon being the dominant grape they grow. But they also have Chardonnay, Merlot, Pinot, and Sauvignon Blanc. And then Sonoma. Sonoma takes a close second to Napa. And their primary grape is Pinot Noir. And they make some fantastic Pinot Noir. Uh, and as well as Napa Valley. Napa Valley, like I say, with their Cabernet Sauvignon, it's, it's 
kick ass. It's amazing. California is probably one of the best wine growing regions in the United States, just because they've got such good climate. The temperature is beautiful. The, um, they've got the mountain ranges right there and the Pacific Ocean right there. So that creates like a, let's see, did I write it down in here? So you got your mountain range. Let me stop sharing here. Okay. Go back to, okay. So you got your mountain range and then over here you got the, the Pacific Ocean. Let me, there we go. Mountain range and Pacific Ocean. So you've got, let's see. This is all backwards for me. When I put up my right hand, it's the left hand on here. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm just going to do it this way. Okay. So here's your mountain range and here's the Pacific Ocean. And then right up in here, this is the perfect, excellent grape growing region because the steam, okay, steam comes up from here, gets trapped on to, up to the top of the mountains, and then it comes back over this way for some rainfall. The hot air from this side gets trapped over here, so it creates a cool climate region over here because of the Pacific Ocean. So that makes it excellent for the, the grapes growing to the west of the, the Rocky Mountains. And then also in between the two mountain ranges, there's a nice little valley in between there. And that's where the central central regions, home to the famous Paso Robles, is one of California's oldest wine regions, stretching back to the 1790s. One-fourth of the wines produced here are red, vari are red varieties, including Syrah, Zinfandel, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Merlot. And then you got Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is a great region within central, the Central Coast. It features some award-winning Pinot Noir. And in the South Coast, the most famous wine regions, including Malibu, Temecula, the Temecula Valley, and San Diego County. So that's California. Some awesome, awesome wines coming out of California. They definitely have the right climate and perfect soil and everything to make the, some kick-ass wines. I'm going to keep sipping on the Cab Franc. Tara, cheers. Thanks for watching. Now I'm going to talk about Oregon. Share again. There we go. Okay. Oregon. Here we go. So Oregon is home to some amazing, absolutely amazing Pinot Noir. They have some to die for Pinot Noir. It is so good. They've got a similar similar growing conditions and climate to uh, Germany. So we got 19 certified wine growing regions. And the main the main regions can be broken down into three or four regions with this the subdividing regions. So you got the Columbia George up here, the Columbia Valley, the Snake River Valley off here over here to the right. The Willamette Valley up here to the north, and in southern Oregon, you got the Umpqua Valley, uh, the Rogue Valley. Those are two of the most popular wine growing regions in southern Oregon. Let's see. And the varieties that they grow, other than Pinot Noir, are Syrah, Tempranillo, Cab Franc, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon. Pinot Gris, Oxerois, Chenin Blanc, and Chardonnay. And we got Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris being the top two grape varieties grown in Oregon. Next, I'm going to drop down to Arizona. Hey, 
my dog's barking. <laughs> One of my dogs. Anyhow, Arizona has three main wine growing regions. You got Wilcox, uh, Senoida, Elgin, and the Verde Valley. It's actually, uh, yeah, Senoida, Wilcox, and Verde Valley. Okay. So three-fourths of the state's grapes are award-winning Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, and Merlot. And central Arizona has Jerome. Let's see where is. You can kind of see this one's got the city names on it. You should be able to see Jerome. Where is Jerome? Mm, well, it might be too small of a city to show on this map. But Jerome is in there. But Jerome, that's off of the Verde River. Let's see. Where's the Verde River? There. And the Grand Canyon up here. Jerome's got to be right in this area. Anyhow. So Jerome has, is home to Merkin Vineyards and Caddis's Winery. And that winery and vineyard is owned by my favorite singer, Maynard James Keenan, who happens to be the singer of Tool, The Perfect Circle, and Lucifer. On top of making wonderful music, he also, he also makes excellent wine. So this man, let me stop sharing again. This man, the singer of Tool, he's doing exactly what I want to do, exactly what I what I love to do. You know, he's he's in a band, he's in three bands, and then he's got his own vineyard and his own winery. He's got it all. <laughs> One of these days, I need to get a Cadiz's um, wine for sure. I've never tried any yet to see what they're like, but. From what I hear, they're pretty good. The next episode of the Wine Snob, hopefully it'll all be pre-recorded so I can get back to doing the slow motion shots. I'll do a slow motion pour and a slow motion swirl and slow motion me jumping up and down. No, I'm just kidding. Tara, Chardonnay is your favorite, and Pinot Noir is your favorite. Awesome. Pinot Noir is excellent. I love some Chardonnay, too. Chardonnay is excellent with perch. I mean, Chardonnay is excellent with a lot of things. Chicken, but uh, I love I love it with some perch, especially Lake Erie perch. And Pinot Noir, yeah. Pinot Noir with a good burger, oh, yeah. That's good stuff. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about New York. Go back to sharing my screen again. Share. There it goes. Fifth time's a charm. <laughs> All right. New York. Here we go. So there are four main reason, regions, although this one's showing six or seven. You got Niagara Lake Erie. That's technically one region, but we'll, we'll just go ahead off of this map. There's Niagara Escarpment, okay? And then you got the Lake Erie region. You got Finger Lakes over here. Finger Lakes is probably the, the main region of winemaking in New York. Let me blow this up. Here we go. So that, that's got these lakes here, and that's where... It, it gets the name Finger Lakes because, you know, they're long lakes, kind of like fingers, which makes excellent growing conditions for grapes. Anytime you got a body of water, grapes are going to grow near it, just like Lake Erie here. Um, and then you got the Champlain Valley of New York up here on the top. There's a little bit of grapes growing up there. You got the upper Hudson and then the Hudson River region. A lot of grapes growing there. And then a little bit over here on the tip of Long Island, off on the, the eastern half of Long Island. They got some grapes growing there too. So Finger Lakes is the main region producing amazing Riesling. They make some kick-ass Riesling. It's to die for. Long Island 
and the Hamptons, mostly known for Merlot and Cap. Let's see, yeah, Hamptons. Where's Hamptons down here? Um, it's not on this map. Well, Hamptons, which is somewhere in New York, <laughs> mostly known for Merlot and Cap Franc. The Hudson River winemakers mostly grow a hybrid variety called Saval Blanc. That's it down here. They got a lot of Saval, and that's an excellent white variety that tastes awesome. It's a hybrid. Most red varieties in New York include Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Concord, Catawba, and Frontenac. The whites include Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, Niagara, Elvira, and Saval Blanc. And I got to talk a little bit about the Catawba. It is a, a dark, like it's, it's more like a red, like, like a true red grape, like not like a most what we call red grapes would be, let me go back to, so mo most of what we would call a red grape, that would be like your Cabernet Sauvignon, your Merlot, Tempranillo, you know, and those are going to be very dark, very dark, like almost purple grapes. Some people call them black, you know, they're, we call them reds, but they're a very, you know, that's where you get the idea of a purple grape. So Catawba and grapes like Pinot Gris and Gewürztraminer, that's a true red grape. It's actually, the skin is reddish in color. And when you press those grapes, they tend to be more of a, more of a, it's a white wine, like Catawba and Pinot Gris. Those are both white wines. And let's see, what was I going to say? So you got Pinot, Pinot Gris, Catawba. Catawba, there's your regular white Catawba, which is called white Catawba, even though it's, like I said, it's a reddish looking grape. But it's not all the way red, like a, like a purple, like a dark, you know, like a true red, Cabernet Sauvignon or Cab Franc, one of them. But I guess we we just call, group them all into the same group and call them all reds. But they also make pink Catawba, which is when you take a little bit of the the skins and you ferment the skins on that. So it's normally if you squeeze out your Catawba grapes and then throw away the skins and then ferment the juice, that gives you white Catawba. <coughs> but hang on. So if you take and ferment the grapes with the berries inside, the berries are still in, in your wine while it's fermenting. That means some of the color from that red skin will leak out into the wine and turn it into a rosé or a blush. So that's, that's where you get your pink atop. And if you go to Ferrante's winery, he sells both. So you can definitely get either one of those at just about any gas station or supermarket in Ohio. <laughs> Definitely one of his best-selling wines. Anything I missed about New York? So most New York wines have a strong flavor, lower alcohol content, and a higher acidity level, just because of the climate and the soil. But mostly because of the climate. And that's what I've got to say about New York. Let's see. Yes, white wine from a red grape. Yeah, just look into Pinot Gris or Gewürztraminer. That's another same thing. It was a, a reddish looking grape, but it's it makes a white wine. That wine sticking to my mustache here. Okay. Now let's go to the North Carolina. I looked up the Carolinas, and really all I got was North Carolina. So here we go, North Carolina, and they didn't have much of a map as far as wine growing regions. Oh, first I got to share my screen. Sorry, share screen. There we go. 
I like when it does that. All right. Let's go back to North Carolina. Here we go. So here was the map that I found. And every one of those dots, believe it or not, those are wineries. And these would be like some of the main wine growing regions. This map sucks. I can't see anything. Can't read any of that. <laughs> but this goes to show you scattered all around the state. They're growing, they're growing grapes and making wine. And like I say, they're doing a lot of it up here in the north, up here, and then a little bit in the central area. But again, all these dots are wine, wineries, so they're definitely getting, if they're not growing grapes there, they're getting them from over here, and then they're making grape, making their wine at all these locations. So, North Carolina has five regions. The Appalachian Mountains, Piedmont, Yadkin Valley, the coast and the Ha River Valley. So the Appalachian Mountains are home to Appalachian High Country, Crest of the Blue Ridge, and Upper Hiawassee Highlands. Those are the three wine growing regions within the Appalachian Mountain region. It should be up in, up in here somewhere. And then Piedmont. Piedmont is a French word meaning uh, foot of the mountains. So it makes sense that the region is located between the coastal plains and the mountain ranges. So that would be this one here, Piedmont. And North Carolina is home to 200 wineries. So this, all these dots here doesn't even, that doesn't even begin to cover all the wineries. Oh, and there's a bunch over here up in the left-hand corner too. That's a big wine growing region there. No idea what that's called. <laughs> so the Yadkin Valley has a similar climate and growing season to some of the wineries in Europe, producing Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Merlot, Pinot Noir, and many others. So, so North Carolina, they definitely make a lot of wine there. Definitely to be checked out. Cheers. So now I'm just going to talk about one last place in Ohio or in, in the United States. And that will be Ohio. Oh, hang on. My dog wants to say hi. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah, he's a good boy. He's a good boy. I. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Now you got to go. Hop down. Okay. You're a big dog. You're a real big dog. Okay, go on. Whew. He's a big dog. That's Nova, my chow. All right. So the last wine growing region that I want to talk about in, in the United States is Ohio, where I'm from. My wine growing region. Had to talk about Ohio a bit, especially because we've got 30 wineries. And it's definitely, it's one of them hidden gems that when I looked up wine growing regions in the United States, Ohio was not listed, which that's something I'm working on. That's part of my mission. Part of my goal is to help promote the wineries of Northeast Ohio. So that eventually the rest of the world will recognize us as being a very great wine producing region. One of the growers here has been quoted to say he wishes that we were a, a wine growing region rather than a region of wineries. And that seems to be what's happening because as, as awesome as our Cabernet Franc is, it's just not, doesn't hold, it doesn't hold up to the Cabernet Franc from France. You know, if you get a Cabernet Franc and grow some Cabernet Franc in California, so you get get an Ohio Cab Franc and a California Cab Franc. Compare the two. California is going to have more fruit flavors 
where the Ohio cab frog tends to have more veggie kind of flavors, earthy tones. And you go to France, and France, they, theirs is just to die for. I mean, it's it just tastes wonderful. It's so good. It blows everyone away. France, you know, they, they've got the premier growing conditions of the world. <laughs> so you get a cab frog from France, and it's just going to be amazing. So let me show you Ohio. Let's see here. Ah, there we go. Okay. Share my screen. See if I can get it right. <laughs> All right. Here's Ohio. Had to open up Ohio in a different different program. So the Ohio regions are broken down into what we call trails. So we've got wine trails. So there's the one that I'm from up here in the Northeast. That's called the Vines and Wines Trail. And that's got a whole bunch of wineries that I'll tell you about in a minute. Up here on up from Cleveland to Toledo, that is the Wing and Watch or the Wing Watch and Wine Trail. See, down here in the yellow, that is the Canal Country Wine Trail. There's definitely some good ones that I'll talk about from there. Now, uh, this green one here is Capital City Wine Trail. You've got the Ohio River Wine, Ohio River Valley Wine Trail down here. And over here, the Appalachian Heritage Wine Trail. So those are the places in Ohio that grow grapes. You try growing grapes in any of these other places, and they're not going to grow very well. In fact, even within the Vines and Wines Trail, there's places within there that grapes don't grow very well. If you go all the way over to the very tip corner in Conneaut, you got Marco Vineyards and Buccia Vineyards. They're growing grapes up there because it's nice and high elevation. But then it kind of dips down into my town, Ashtabula, and then it comes back up again for Geneva and Harpersfield and Madison over here. And then because of the high elevation, Tons of wineries within the Geneva, Madison, Harpersfield area. Tons of wineries. Like I say, we got about 30 plus wineries in this region alone. I'll list them off in a minute. So the first variety to grow in Ohio was Catawba. Nicholas Longworth successfully planted Catawba in Ohio in the mid-1800s. And then Concord took over in most vineyards. It was the main grape grown mostly because it's the main grape that they could grow in Ohio. It's an American variety. And back then, Welch's paid a good price for uh, Concord grapes. And then sometime during the, I'm not sure exactly when it happened, between the 1970s and the 1990s, somewhere in that range, <laughs> Welch's decided they're not going to pay so much for Concord grapes anymore. So the price dropped dramatically almost to the point where it's not even worth growing Concords anymore. So most vineyard owners decided, well, if they want to make some real money, let's start switching over to vinifera. And the first couple of that, that happened between the 1970s and the 1980s. Yeah. Debonet and Marco vineyards. They started messing around with vinifera grapes, followed by Ferrante's winery. Those are like the three kings of the wines and vines wine trail. And then Northeast Ohio along, yeah, like I said, it has over 30 wineries. And we've got a similar climate to Germany and Ukraine and Northern France. So a lot of the grapes that could grow over there can also grow over here. The only difference being the soil. So what we have to do is graft the grapes to an American grape varieties rootstock. So we can plant Chardonnay or Pinot Noir or Cabernet Sauvignon as long as we graft it to an American rootstock. Down here in the Canton, Akron, Youngstown area, we've got Gervasi Vineyard, had some great wines, as well as Luva Bella Winery or Red Blends. A Luva, uh, Red Blends, that used to, if you look up uh, the red-headed winemaker, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm a red-headed winemaker as well. <laughs> I mean, go back. Yeah, so I, I know I'm also a redheaded winemaker, but 
I'm not the redheaded winemaker. That's a girl. And she, I, I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but the winery is called Lugabella Winery. And like I say, the, the wines that she makes, a lot of times it just says red blends. And that red blends wine, that is actually California grapes. And they've, they've got their own plot of land out in California. So they grow grapes out there, Zinfandel and Carmenere specifically. And they bring it back to Ohio to Lufabella Winery, and then they make their wines there. And I'm yet to find out. I've been told they make a dry red that I haven't discovered yet. So she said, I'll have to try that one out. She likes to autograph her bottles as well. So hopefully I'll be able to get an autograph bottle from her for my autograph bottle collection. So yeah, now I'm just going to show you, or I'm going to go ahead and name off all the wineries in Northeast Ohio. Just because I said there was actually got 38 different places highlighted here. Some of them are brewing companies, but the majority of them are wineries. We got Ferrante's Winery, Laurentia Winery. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about him too. Ferrante's Winery, that was the one that I worked at. He was a third generation winemaker. Started off in Cleveland, and now Nick Ferrante is in Harpersfield with his whole family making wine. Laurentia Winery, uh, they named their winery after the Laurentide Glacier. So, and that's what carved out our area the way back in, when, in the ice ages when the glaciers were here. You know, that's what carved out the Great Lakes. And that was the Laurentide Glacier is what they named that. So we call, they called their winery Laurentia. Then you got Rosabella, Lorello Vineyards. Lorellos is, I've talked about them in previous episodes. I think I, I even featured one of their wines. It was Simply Mad. They make the Vidal Blanc ice wine that is infused with habanero pepper. That's an awesome wine. <coughs> it's that time of year. I've got a cough. So we've got Old Firehouse Winery, Buccia Vineyard, and Buccia's They've got, that's an awesome winery. It's, that's a, one of them that's over in Conneaut, Ohio. They have a couple of stages, one or a couple of stages right there at, in the winery. And then I, I'm told in the back with the view of the vineyard, there's another stage back there, like more of a, an outdoor stage kind of a thing. Still, I think it's attached to the back of their, their winery, but, uh, so they like to bring in lots of bands, lots of live live music entertainment. And the other gimmick, gimmick, uh, the other thing they have going on, the service they offer, is a uh, bread and a bed and breakfast. A bread and breakfast? <laughs> Let me drink some more of this wine. A bread and breakfast. <laughs> yeah. They offer a bed and breakfast. And it is a fantastic, awesome place to stay. For Northeast Ohioans that want to stay in a good place for honeymoon or anniversary or anything like that, it's a good place to go. Mm -hmm. Amity Grant's watching, and Nora McKenna, and Tanya Miller. Thanks for watching. So after after Buccia, we've also got Casitic Vineyards. Very good vineyard, one of the, one of the good ones around here. Deer's Leap Winery, Marco Vineyard. You've heard me talk about Marco Vineyard in the past. Marco Vineyard was one of the first. Arnie Esterer of Marco Vineyards. He was one of the first winemakers in Ohio to start growing Pinifera grapes. Like I said, before that, they were all growing Catabas or Concords from Niagara's. And he started, he talked to Dr. Frank, Dr. Frank Constantine from New York. Who came over from Russia to escape Russia during the Cold War. And he learned from him. 50 years later, still going strong. He actually passed away a couple of years after his 50 year anniversary. So 
he's one of he's one of the winemakers in Northeast Ohio that we all miss dearly. He taught us all many lessons on how to make wine and how to grow grapes in Ohio. So we got Maple Ridge Vineyard, Hunley Cellars. That was the very first episode, which might not be on this channel. I know if you go, if you look up the B team on YouTube, it was our first attempt at a YouTube channel. I believe it's on there and it hasn't been brought over to this channel yet. But Hundley Cellars is an excellent winery with some fantastic wine. Just down the road from that is Cask 307. Cask 307, along with, uh, I believe, Grand River Cellars and Debonet are all and maybe South River Vineyard. I'm not sure. They're all connected, kind of, with the people that own them. Then you got Verant Family Winery, Old Mill Winery, Grand River Cellars, Harper's Field Vineyard, The Stable Winery, Silver Crest Cellars, Benny Vino Urban Winery. He's an awesome guy. I borrowed a press from him the first time that I had to press some grapes with the help of John Manis from Hunley Cellars. We've got Emmerine Estates Winery, Bocce Winery, South River Vineyard, the winery at Spring Hill. It's a very popular, more of a restaurant, but they serve wine and make some there too. M Cellars. M Cellars is my favorite in Northeast Ohio. They are awesome. Emerita Winery, another one that I used to work at. And that one is up and coming. They're still still in construction and getting everything ready but they're already making wine their vineyards have been there for a while now years and she's been making wine for a couple years well she's been making wine for a few years but for a couple years now it's been about ready to ready to sell so keep an eye out for some emerita winery wines red barn sellers they make a lot of fruit wines you got saint joseph's vineyard then there's debonet vineyards i'll show you that one again debonet They make, along with Ferrantes and a bunch of them, every, you know, every variety under the sun. <laughs> Goddess Winehouse, Stonegate Winery. Let's see, let me drop down here. We're at number 30. Okay. Sussex Chalet and Winery, Regal Vineyards, Vineyard Woods. And then we got Double Wing Brewing Company. Park Avenue Winery, Ohio State Grape Research Station. They grow a lot of grapes. I don't know if they're making wine with it, but they grow a lot of grapes there and they use it for research and they're connected with Ohio State University. Then we got the Kent State University Viticulture and Enology Department. That's over at Kent State. You can get a degree from them right in my hometown about growing grapes and making wine. And then the Louvabella Winery, Redhead Blinds. That's a little south of us, but uh, I had to throw it on the list. And then there's also Red Eagle Distillery, which was also connected with Debonet and Cask 07. Like I said, that's just a distillery. They make a lot of whiskey and some other stuff, but we have one of those here too. All right. Check the comments. Hey, Julio. Thanks for watching, Julio. You guys got to ask me some questions. Start, t start asking me about wine. <laughs> or tell me, tell me some of your favorite wines. What are some of the wines you guys like? Put it in the comments. So last, the last episode, I forgot to do the wine trivia segment. Oh, sorry. So I believe the question that we were waiting on from the previous episode was, what is a fortified wine? So that was the question. What is fortified wine? The answer is, it's a wine that has spirits added to it halfway through fermentation. So they'll take a wine, they'll start fermenting, and it'll be going for a little bit. They're expecting it to keep going. Once they think they're at the halfway mark, then they'll take some vodka or something, Everclear or something like that and pour that in and that'll give it some some alcohol 
it's it's for specific varieties like if you want to make a sweet a sweet wine then you can you can make it a, a fortified wine because then it, it'll cut the alcohol it'll set it'll slow the fermentation down once you add the spirits and it will leave it as a little bit sweeter but you just added alcohol so that the alcohol contents up there so that and then that changes the flavor a little bit you know because you added vodka so vodka's got a similar a, a different taste than wine so um it, it's interesting it's it's a good one to try if, you know if you're curious about what a fortified wine is like some wineries around here make some some awesome fortified wines i'm more of a dry a dry wine fan so i don't i don't go for the fortified ones as often but that doesn't mean that i've had some and they're pretty good so let's see tara says what does cab franc taste like so this one let me let me pour a little more here i'm running out oh yeah so it's got a nice dark red color to it when i smell it i get some cherry cherry blackberry almost like a hint of raspberry mm-hmm mm. Yeah, black cherry heavily. And then also, like I said, it's got the earthy veggie kind of flavors a little bit. The one trick is to slurp it. <laughs> you put you drink a little bit, hold it in your mouth, and suck in some air. Air. Uh, breaks down the alcohol and opens up the flavors. So that's why you keep your your wine sealed up for years without touching any oxygen. And finally, when you crack it open, let it ex get some air exposure. That's why you do the swirl. So it gives it some air contact to help bring out the flavors. It's nice to let it sit for about a minute or so. In fact, some some wines that you can buy, it's good to decant them. So you can buy a decanter. It's like this this vase looking thing. You pour your wine into it, and that just allows it to get more air contact with all of it, and opens it up so it uh, the flavors come out. A lot of young wines need decanted. Let's see. Who used to drink Red Cat? It wasn't too bad. You mean like cat, our Catsatelli? I had that a couple of weeks. That's a white. So I'm not sure. Oh, red Catawba? Or are you talking about pink Catawba? I'm not sure what you're talking about there. Julio says, ever heard Thunderbird wine before? I've never heard of that one. What's it like? All right. Well, I think that's about it. Went over the different wine growing regions of the United States. Went over. Oh, I forgot to ask the next wine trivia question. <laughs> so I answered the last one. Here's the next one. So the next wine trivia question that I'll answer in two weeks is who wrote the book Magic in a Bottle? If you've watched my episodes in the past, this should be an easy one. And with that, I'm going to let you guys go. Have a happy Mother's Day. And I'll see you next time. Enjoy the wines. Enjoy the vines. Make sure you drink responsibly. Make sure you check out all the other shows on the on Cosmos Creative TV. There's a lot of good ones. A lot of excellent shows. And you all need to see them. I'll see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>